Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining 2021 Sunshine Week at NARA. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panel by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note all audio connections are muted as this conference is being recorded. You're welcome to submit written questions throughout the session, which will be addressed at the Q&A session of the meeting. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I'll turn the webinar over to David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States. Please go ahead. Or Alina Simo. Yes, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, rather. Sorry, this is Alina Simo. Um, I am the Director of the Office of Government Information Services. I want to welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, thank you all for joining us virtually at the National Archives today as we kick off our celebration of Sunshine Week 2021. Uh, whether you're joining us by WebEx or the NARA YouTube channel, we welcome you. I hope everyone has been staying healthy, safe, and well. Uh, as uh, some of you may know, OGIS resolves FOIA disputes, identifies methods to improve compliance with the statute, and educate our stakeholders about the FOIA process. And we're very excited once again to help uh, David Ferrier, the Archivist of the United States, host uh, Sunshine Week at the Archives. It is hard to believe that one year ago we had to cancel our Sunshine Week event due to the global pandemic. But if this past year has taught us anything, it is that we can adapt to changing circumstances. And we have been successful in hosting numerous virtual events since March 2020. Each year, we honor Sunshine Week by promoting dialogue about the importance of open government and access to information, values that are central to the mission of the National Archives and Records Administration. We have put together an exciting program this afternoon, and I'm particularly pleased that we will be bringing viewpoints from both the judicial and legislative branches. Please visit our website, archives.gov forward slash OGIS. There you will find more information regarding today's program, including speaker biographies. This will help maximize the time you hear from all of our speakers today. A few brief housekeeping items before we launch into today's program. Members of the OGIS staff will be monitoring the chat functions both in WebEx and the NARA YouTube channel throughout this afternoon. Uh, we will leave a few minutes at the end of each segment for audience questions that you may type directly into the chat function of either platform. If you experience any technical difficulties while participating via WebEx, please feel free to chat our event producer for assistance. On the YouTube channel, our OGIS staff will do their best to assist you with any technical issues. Unlike other public events OGIS has hosted in the past, we will not be accepting questions via telephone and we will not take a break. Now, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce the Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, who will officially kick off our program today. David Ferriero was confirmed as the 10th Archivist of the United States on November 6, 2009. Prior to his confirmation as Archivist, David served as the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the New York Public Library and held top positions at two of the major nation, uh, nation's academic libraries, MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. He earned his Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts degrees in English Literature from Northeastern University in Boston, and a Master of Arts degree from the Simmons College of Library and Information Science, also in Boston. Since early in his tenure, David has committed the National Archives to the principles of open government, transparency, participation, and collaboration, which are the very values we are all celebrating today. David has also been a constant supporter of OGIS and the work that we do, and we are extremely grateful for his sustained support and leadership. Please join me now in welcoming the Archivist of the United States, David S. Ferriero, to kick off today's program. Thank David, you, Alina, over to you. and greetings from my office at the National Archives Building on Pennsylvania Avenue here in Washington. A year after the COVID-19 pandemic forced cancellation of Sunshine Week events across the country, including here at the National Archives, I recognize the difficult times we've all faced over the past year as we've distanced ourselves from one another, juggled professional and personal obligations, and grappled with national and international unrest and uncertainty. Sunshine Week is an annual nationwide celebration of access to public information mid-March that coincides with the birthday of the fourth president of the United States, James Madison. 
Tomorrow, March 16th, marks 270 years since his birth, and it's particularly fitting that we at the National Archives celebrate Mr. Madison. Among the many treasures of, the, of America's past and the holdings of the National Archives are two documents that Mr. Madison played a pivotal role in drafting and promoting the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Mr. Madison was largely responsible for the proposals guaranteeing freedom of the press and ensuring jury trials matters that are near and dear to today's program guests as well as to our democracy. In a letter penned in 1825, Mr. Madison said, the advancement and diffusion of knowledge is the only guardian of true liberty. 141 years later, in 1966, the 34th President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson, echoed that sentiment in signing the Freedom of Information Act into law. In his bill signing statement, President Johnson noted, I have always believed that freedom of information is so vital that only the national security not the desire of public officials or private citizens should determine when it must be restricted. Today, government transparency remains as important as ever, both within and beyond the FOIA framework. Our National Archives staff works to make access happen, not just during Sunshine Week, but each and every day, even during a global pandemic. Despite teleworking full-time, staff members from our Office of Research Services are responding to reference requests preparing and submitting digitized files and metadata for upload into the National Archives catalog, among many other tasks. Mission Essential staff members in our National Personal Records Center in St. Louis have regularly reported to work throughout the pandemic to access paper records often needed to support veterans and their families with urgent matters such as medical emergencies, homeless veterans seeking shelter and funeral services for deceased veterans. These exceptional National Archives staff pioneered alternate work processes incorporating physical distancing and other protective measures to ensure a safe work environment while providing this critical service. As we work to cultivate access to important government records, the National Archives also continues to set the pace in, government, in the government-wide effort to modernize federal agency record keeping and transform to a fully electronic government. Since the pandemic started one year ago, NARA's Office of Government Information Services, the federal FOIA ombudsman, has responded to more than 4,000 inquiries from requesters and agencies seeking assistance with the FOIA process. OGIS has published seven compliance assessments on topics as wide ranging as agency communication with requesters during the pandemic and proactive posting of documents on agency FOIA websites. OGIS connects with customers in many other ways, including through the FOIA Advisory Committee and in public events such as this one. It's a special treat to welcome the Honorable Judge Royce Lamberth of the U.S. District Court here in Washington, D.C. Judge Lamberth is a longtime friend of the National Archives and in pre-pandemic times frequently presided over naturalization ceremonies as immigrants have taken their oaths of U.S. citizenship in front of the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, our nation's cherished charters of freedom. Today he is joined by his biographer and former law clerk, Adam Perlman, to discuss open government and the legal landscape. Following the conversation, another friend of the National Archives, Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, will join us in a recorded message. Senator Leahy, who chairs the Senate Appropriations Committee, was elected to the Senate in 1974, the same year that Congress amended FOIA in the wake of the Watergate scandal and several other court decisions. In, a four plus, in his four plus decades since, he has led every congressional effort to reform FOIA and is a true champion of the statute and of government transparency overall. Finally, we'll close our celebration with a panel of open government experts continuing the discussion about U.S. transparency. I'm pleased to welcome Michael Bakesha of Ju Judicial Watch, Katie Townsend of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, and Alexander Perloff Giles of Gibson Dunn Crutcher's Media Entertainment and Technology Practice, and a member of the FOIA Advisory Committee. Their discussion will be moderated by Kirsten Mitchell of OGIS. 
So happy Sunshine Week. I hope you enjoyed today's program, and I turn the microphone back to Alina. David, thanks very much for that enthusiastic introduction, and uh, we're right on schedule. So I'm going to continue our celebration of open governance, uh, introducing our first event on our agenda. I know you all share my excitement in hearing from senior United States District Court Judge Royce C. Lambert today. Judge Lambert has served on the United States District Court for the District of Columbia since 1987, including as the presiding judge of the United States Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court from 1995 to 2002, as chief judge from 2008 to 2013, and since 2013 as a senior judge. Most recently, Judge Lambert has been assigned as a visiting judge for the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas, which makes sense since Judge Lambert is a San Antonio native having earned his BA from the University of Texas and an LLB from the University of Texas School of Law. We owe our gratitude today to Adam Perlman, Judge Lambert's former law clerk, for pulling together the segment today. Adam himself has a distinguished resume. He is a national security law expert with many years of experience, both in the executive and judicial branches of government. He has a JD from GW Law School and a BA from UCLA. I was particularly intrigued to learn that Adam speaks and reads Portuguese, but we hope the conversation with Judge Lambert today will be in English. Please join me in welcoming Senior Judge Royce Lambert and his former law clerk, Adam Perlman, for what is sure to be a fascinating conversation regarding Judge Lambert's judicial legacy. Over to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Alina, and I can promise it will be in, in English today. There are clips of me in Portuguese uh, out there, but uh, we'll, we'll spare everybody that, uh, that suffering. But uh, thanks again, Alina. Thank you, Mr. Ferrio. Thank you, National Archives, and Alina, your whole team at, at OGIS. Uh, you know, I, on behalf of me and, and Judge Lambert, I think it's fair to say we are both honored to be here. Um, as recently as last week, uh, the Washington Post called Judge Lambert a fiery presence on the bench, and I think we'll probably see a bit of that today. As his biographer, I, I might have certain biases, but one of the questions that I've been asking people who I've interviewed is not some sycophantic exercise of, is he the best trial judge on the bench, or is he the nicest, or, uh, you know, is he the most eloquent? What I have asked is, uh, is he one of the most consequential trial jurists uh, in the United States in the last 50 years? And not a single person that I've spoken to so far has quarreled with that proposition. His, his cases touching on government transparency are but one reason why. Mr. Ferrier himself once mentioned to me that at least at some point he had more published FOIA cases than any other judge. He's in the uh, Freedom Forum Institute's National Freedom of Information Hall of Fame. And, of course, there's more from the law that he's created in, the, in national security cases with respect to the handling of classified information uh, or to his defense of or adjudication of uh, some of the biggest civil suits brought against the United States to some key rulings with respect, with respect to the very secretive grand jury process. Today we get to publicly talk about some of these issues and perhaps preview some of the stories and uh, perspective that may ultimately appear in the book couple of quick ground rules. We have about an hour and plan to save some time for Q&A, uh, but obviously won't be discussing any matter that's currently in any stage of litigation. Uh, nothing said should be construed as suggesting how Judge Lambert might rule in any particular case in the future, nor does any opinion that I might offer today necessarily represent the policy or position of any department or agency that I've happened to work for. Um, and I figure we'll just kick this off that because of Sunshine Week, let's begin with a case that implicated, at least in a small way, the Sunshine Act. Uh, Judge, uh, can you talk to us about uh, your 1993 case of Association of American Physicians and Surgeons versus Clinton? Well, it was one of the first uh, cases I had involving the Sunshine Act. The Advisory Committee Act uh, was uh, intended to be open, and if you did not have all government employees, the meetings had to be open, and if they were not open, the minutes had to be public. And uh, when President Clinton first came to office, he decided to set up a task force 
to decide health health care should be uh, reformed, something that ultimately happened under President Biden years later. But when President Clinton first took office, he set up a health care task force, and he made the first lady the chairman of the task force. Uh, she was not a government employee, so it was clear to me when the case was brought by this Association of Physicians and Surgeons that she had to have the meetings open to the public and the minutes had to, uh, the meetings that had already been held had to be made public. Uh, and the statute was crystal clear. Uh, and so I ordered that uh, the meetings be open to the public and the meeting minutes be, op be made public. And it was like uh, a huge uh, upsetting of the apple cart for the Clinton administration. It was, I had ruled, uh, they took off uh, January 20th. I had ruled by early March that all this had to be done. They took an emergency appeal and the appeal was decided by May, so it was on a very fast track. Uh, interestingly enough, the Court of Appeals reversed me. Uh, it was a, a, an interesting experience for a district judge. I had been on some time by then, and uh, I was quite confident that on the law I was right. Uh, Twenty years later, I still think on the law I was right. The law was crystal clear. Uh, if you're not a government employee, this is the way it works. Uh, the Court of Appeals uh, found that she was the functional equivalent, whatever that means, of a government employee. Obviously, the First Lady was unique. But she was not a government employee. The conflict of interest laws did not apply. All the normal things that go along with government employment, like conflict of interest laws and statutory requirements that would apply to who could meet with her and who couldn't and all those sorts of things did not apply. The groups did not have to make disclosures since she was not a government employee, all those sorts of things. But the Court of Appeals actually ruled that she was the functional equivalent, whatever that means, of a government employee. So they reversed me and said that this could all be done in secret. Well, you can imagine that there was quite a consternation. And ultimately, uh, I was blamed when the health care task force went down in flames. <laughs> it was one of the major failures of the new Clinton administration. And it was uh, a complete disaster in public relations for the new Clinton administration that uh, the whole health care task force foundered on their lack of transparency and their refusal to do this out in the open and the way they went about trying to secretly develop a plan to reconnoiter uh, the whole health care system. And uh, it was done when the Obama administration came in and uh, they then did a new plan. They did it all in the open. Uh, they they then ran into some trouble because they couldn't get a single Republican to vote for it. So it was also a controversial plan. It became known as Obamacare because they didn't get a single Republican vote, but they got it through. They, it was voted through, uh, contrary to the Clinton plan. But in any event, it was a, a major setback for the Clinton administration because they tried to do it in secret and it didn't succeed. I was uh, 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 never uh, in doubt about what the law was. I was uh, always in doubt about why the Supreme Court refused to take the case. But it, obviously it was a very political case in terms of uh, what is the role of the First Lady and what, what does that mean about just rewriting the law to take care of the First Lady's position, which the Court of Appeals did very conveniently, and say she's the functional equivalent of a government employee. That was one of the most significant early on cases I had about openness in government, but I've certainly had my share over the years. Indeed you I, have. I do want to add one thing while we're here, and that is it's a great honor for me to be invited by David Ferriero to give this talk today. The archives under his leadership, has done a terrific job of responding and being transparent and helping with government transparency. Uh, and, and I very much appreciate Mr. Ferriero's efforts 
at uh, keeping this going. Some agencies have done better than others during the pandemic. The archives is one of those that has really tried to keep the effort ongoing. Uh, many agencies have really just stopped processing FOIA, and, and it has been a real hardship in many agencies to get documents out at all because they've given such a back seat to FOIA during this year of the pandemic. The archives has really led the way in, in not letting that happen. And I commend the archives and Mr. Perio's leadership of the archives of how he has really not, not let that happen at the archives. The archives is, under his leadership, a leading part of the government, always in transparency and openness. And I'm delighted to be able to have the opportunity to, to talk about that subject today. Uh, it, indeed, and I, I guess that's a good way to uh, get immediately to the what is really the workhorse law, uh, I guess, of, of government transparency, and, and that would be the Freedom of Information Act that, that's very familiar to, to everyone. Um, there's certainly more we'll talk about more, but let's talk about FOIA for a couple of minutes. Uh, evidently, you've, uh, you're nearing about 200 published FOIA opinions. Uh, and in one from a, a few years ago uh, called uh, Lebeau, the Department of Justice, you did note that, uh, and I'll quote, for anyone skeptical of the truth behind the cliche that freedom is not free, FOIA litigation is perhaps one of the best examples of the costs of open government. In this area of law, fights over singular words and individual sentences routinely last several rounds of administrative review and litigation, including volleying between the district and appellate courts. This opinion alone will dedicate several hundred words to examining whether the FBI may withhold a single sentence. That's, of course, just one opinion, that, you know, one, one passage and one opinion of, uh, of many, many years of, of FOIA uh, jurisprudence. But it is certainly a resource-intensive process. And can you briefly talk about how you handle FOIA cases as a judge uh, versus how you litigated them when you were an assistant U.S. attorney? Well, most FOIA cases will go if, with the, uh, some process of getting the documents processed first and uh, then going by way of motion for summary judgment, opposition reply, and uh, a presumption of regularity. Uh, sometimes you will have cases. I had a case called Judicial Watch. I had many cases with Judicial Watch. You're going to hear one of their representatives on the panel today. I'm going to stay on the line and hear uh, that panel because I, I like to hear practitioners in this area and, and Judicial Watch certainly is, is one of the leading practitioners that appears before me a lot. Uh, one of their early cases that I had with them back in 98 was uh, uh, they were alleging that the Department of Commerce uh, had records that would prove their thesis that if you made a certain contribution to the Democratic National Committee of $100,000, you would get on a trade mission and could fly overseas with Secretary Brown, the Secretary of Commerce, and if you made that amount of contribution to DNC, then you would get to go on a trade mission with Secretary of Commerce overseas. And they were trying to get records to demonstrate that from the Commerce Department under FOIA. They came up with enough information that I was allowing discovery. So they had shown some inconsistencies in Commerce's affidavits and I had opened up discovery, and they, I said to Mr. Clayman, who was then representing Judicial Watch, that every time he got some discovery, he turned over a rock, and I would have to authorize some more discovery. And you're doing it step by step in FOIA because normally you don't allow discovery in FOIA, but he kept overturning rocks and finding other stuff, and it finally got to the point where he overturned some information that demonstrated that this deputy undersecretary had taken a box of documents home, and then they denied they had these documents, but he had them at home. The reason they didn't have them in their possession was he had the documents at his house. And he had pretty good evidence of this, so he had a whistleblower that actually had given him a statement that he filed with me in camera. So I actually 
got the marshals and gave them a subpoena, and they went over and they got the box of documents at this deputy undersecretary's house. And it was the documents that were the smoking gun. And I got them by subpoena from the deputy undersecretary's house. So it was a, obviously an unusual Freedom of Information Act case that goes that way, but it proved the truth of what they were trying to prove in the first place. And that is what you call open government. The documents were there, but they were at his house, so they denied him under the Freedom of Information Act. They didn't have him in the government's possession because the secretary took him home. <laughs> Get a new equipment and a first for me. Uh, I, I've had some other interesting FOIA cases as well. I, I, I have a couple if you want to talk about. A couple I've had with Landmark Legal Foundation. Uh, they, sure. I don't know if they topped that one where the deputy undersecretary took them home. But. Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, you've got a couple of different ones with uh, Landmark Legal against uh, EPA uh, in, involving a couple of different administrators. I, I think from both parties, I, I want to emphasize both that. Uh, I, I, yeah. held, I held both a Republican EPA head and a Democratic EPA head were both miscreants. Uh, the first one, the, uh, <laughs> the Republican head of EPA, I had information just before the I guess this would have been in, uh, I, I forget which election. Anyway, it was a Republican head of EPA, and the, the uh, Landmark Legal Foundation had information that she was going to leave office on uh, January 20th, and they were trying to get records of all the, the regulations that she was trying to repeal and, and, and other regulations she was trying to hurry up right before she left office, and they're trying to get all these records uh, just before she was leaving office and so what she was doing those last few days she was leaving school. And uh, they came in like two days before she was leaving office, and they had some information that showed some things that had been going on in the administrator's staff that led me to agree that I would give an order that she could not destroy her hard drive on the day she was leaving office and could not destroy any other records in her office and things like that. So I had a, a hearing two days before she left office and entered an order that her hard drive be preserved by the government and her other records and so on. I issued the order. On the morning of the inauguration, she went to her office and physically destroyed the hard drive on her computer and uh, destroyed all the records that would have been, they would have been seeking. And I ended up with a order to show cause why she should not be held in contempt, uh, and, and the agency should not be held in contempt as well. And it turned out at the trial that no one told her about my order. So she actually honestly did not know of my order. The agency lawyers did not tell her. No one told her, so she actually had no personal knowledge of my order. So I held the agency in contempt, but she did not ever, she was never told. Anyone, no one ever told her that I had entered that order, and she could not be held personally in contempt of my order. I could not hold her and did not hold her personally in contempt. You can't hold someone in contempt if they don't know of the order. Uh, the, so, but I did hold the agency in contempt and they did get stopped with attorney fees and a lot of bad publicity for having destroyed the, the records that would have shown what the plaintiffs wanted personally, perhaps, but of course it had been destroyed at that point. There were other records that then demonstrated some of what the plaintiffs wanted, but the key was, was gone. Uh, obviously that's not openness in government when you're destroying your hard drive on the day you're leaving office. Uh, probably other actions could have been taken under the Federal Records Act and maybe other statutes that maybe were being violated that day as well. That was not before me on the contempt motion, but in any event, uh, just to show that it's not always just one party, uh, four years later, <laughs> I have another FOIA case pending 
a different administrator, not even that the one that replaced that one, but it's another one. And uh, in the discovery, there began to be some suspicious things that nothing that ever goes to the administrator, no policies are ever acted on by the administrator herself. And it, it begins to look a little suspicious, but how is this agency ever run and the administrator herself, she never has a fingerprint for anything. And how do they actually decide anything where the administrator has never actually done anything? And so I begin to wonder if maybe something is going on. And somewhere in there, based on some discovery I allow, which is unusual in Florida, but I did allow some discovery, they find out <clears throat> she had created a FOIA account in her dog's name. And if you wanted to uh, go to the administrator for her approval of anything, you sent it to her dog. And all of the FOIA stuff went in her dog's name to her. And she did everything in her dog's name, not in her name. And then when you made a FOIA request, it was processed in her name. And no one ever processed any FOIA documents in her dog's name. So they had been denying under FOIA all of these requests because uh, – uh, they, they never processed anything in the dog's name. No one had ever requested anything in the dog's name. They didn't know it was in her dog's name. Uh, actually, that one created such a scandal that she was ended up being forced to resign as administrator. Uh, so I never actually had to rule on contempt or any of that stuff from that one because she was forced to resign by public acclamation, I guess, after a landmark legal uncovered all that in the discovery. So I've had my share of unusual FOIA cases as well in my time. Uh, by and large, you know, those are the exceptions, not the rules, uh, uh, luckily. But sometimes you do uncover unusual circumstances. Right. It, it, it's easy and, and admittedly a, a little bit fun in a, in a dark way. Uh, to poke fun at the at the foibles of government and, and misdeeds of, of some people over, over the years. It's just a matter of statistics. When you're dealing with a, an organization of literally millions of people, you're going to find some people who have behaved badly sometimes. Um, of course, it's just unfortunate with the pain of the agency. <laughs> well, it, it, yes, it is, uh, very, very much so. And, and that brings up other questions of leadership and, and standards and ethics as well. Um, but, you know, as you mentioned, you know, despite having these numerous high-profile sensational cases where it's clear that somebody in the government behaved badly, and that's to be generous sometimes, we still, in FOIA cases, start off with a presumption of good faith. Um, can you explain a bit about that for us and, and what a plaintiff really has to show uh, to, to pierce that veil and, and get discovery? Well, there has to be something unusual. I mean, we, we day to day, we expect the government to act in good faith, and day to day, that's what we see the government doing, and day to day, uh, the FOIA people in most instances have no ax to grind, and, you know, they're just processing the documents and screening them. The FOIA lawyers have no ax to grind. The justice lawyers that typically are in the case have not in, been involved in the underlying dispute and have no special reason to cover up uh, or, or be a participant in the covering up things. Obviously, there is a, uh, an overall temptation in the government to not want to come forward and make clear that they screwed this up. Uh, that's a, a, a human tendency to not want to admit your mistakes or broadcast your mistakes. But we find across the board that uh, in most instances, the government tries to make arguments that are facially valid, and uh, we can look at them and, and uh, analyze whether they're facially valid or not. And uh, there's got to be something more than just speculation to get you into discovery. There's got to be some, some factual basis. 
what what I was finding in those cases we've been talking about was the something more that led to getting you discovery. We're not going to give discovery and let you open the coffers to the government's files in every case. It would just bog down the government so they could not function if we did that in every case. So you've got to have the something more, something suspicious, something that points to being able to put this burden on the government. And there's got to be something that would lead a judge to think that the government is doing something suspicious before we're going to put that burden on the government of, of going through all that. And uh, many plaintiffs will try to do that, but almost always I see what they're doing is just speculating that, well, there must be something there, and they really have nothing more than speculation. And they've got to have some basis for the speculation before I'm going to authorize the discovery. But I understand in the back of my mind that it's possible there's something there. So plaintiffs frequently then will say, well, look at it in camera. Looking at it in camera is not a really great basis because that's really just substituting my judgment for the government's judgment. It's looking at the documents themselves that they're choosing to give me. That's not any real answer to whether or not the government is hiding things or not disclosing things that they should be disclosing. I'm, I'm looking at things in a vacuum when I'm looking at them in camera. And the plaintiff isn't getting to see what I'm seeing, but the public isn't getting to see it either. And it's an uncomfortable situation that I'm in to just think that I wave some magic wand and look at it in camera. I don't think that's a great way to do for you litigation. I very rarely want to look at things in camera. Because I think that's just cutting the plaintiff out of the process totally for me to look at it in camera. Uh, and that's not a great answer either. And, and I've seen you get pretty frustrated with plaintiffs who come into court citing nothing but anonymously sourced news reports as well. I think that's uh, considered speculation and, and well, I, not I evidence. I try to resist when, when people tell me, well, based on some story in the Washington Post, and I I try to not just knock the post, but I don't credit news accounts. You know, news accounts are not evidence. So, you know, I, I try to resist saying I don't believe what I read in the Washington Post. I just say I don't believe news accounts, <laughs> although I read the post every day. So I, I could say this, but I, I don't read news accounts as evidence. So you, you need something as evidence, not just the Washington Post story to say that you have evidence. Um, what is what is the uh, respective role as you see it, both from your experience as being civil chief in, in D.C. and and from the bench? Uh, what would you what what do you think, and what might you recommend in terms of uh, the respective roles of the responsive office and agency counsel and the Justice Department in, in these cases? Well, hopefully they work together. Um, agency counsel are closer to the uh, agency people that are working in the documents that know about the documents, that understand the documents, that understand the record-keeping system. And hopefully they can educate the justice lawyers. The justice lawyers hopefully uh, understand the judicial process better, know the judges better, if they practice in our court, they probably have an inkling about the judges and how the judges have ruled in other FOIA cases and know the kinds of things that appeal and don't appeal to the judges, may even know some of the case law the judges rely on, know that there are certain judges that uh, uh, you might as well not make that argument to, <laughs> and uh, you, other judges you might want to, you know, look at what you're arguing and and certain approaches you want, might want to take. I mean, having written as many FOIA opinions as I have now, uh, you know, when I first came on the court, uh, I think my first five years, when lawyers started citing me to myself, I was quite alarmed. Uh, I said, don't you have something better than that? Because I really wanted, you know, some real judge that had cited 
the case, you know, and decided this and said it's just me. And the lawyers were very delighted. So they found something I had said before that they thought I'd want to do that again, that I was hoping they had something better than just citing me. But I find lawyers really like it when they find something I've said before. They they think I ought to say the same thing again. You know, well, lawyers do that. And lawyers find where I've ruled in this FOIA exemption before, I, I guarantee you, if they got the same exemption, they're going to cite where I've said that before, you know. And that's a pretty smart lawyer, actually, because I don't want to contradict myself. So, you know, the agency lawyers really don't have that kind of depth of knowledge of how to present the case that the justice lawyers and the U.S. attorneys do. Even the U.S. attorneys have a, a more depth knowledge of the judges here. Sometimes the justice lawyers do if they get a lot of FOIA cases here. They'll know very well which ones are going to appeal to me and which ones they can cite me to myself in. I, I do try over the years to not contradict myself. But I think many judges try to do it that way. So it, it's smart for a lawyer to cite the judge to himself because I don't want to be inconsistent with my own prior right. Agency lawyers don't yeah. always that judges have that mindset. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Now, I've just shot myself in the foot, I guess, by <laughs> revealing that little tactic. But. Well, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you've been overturned, too, and it would be a bad idea to cite you on a principle, but uh, <laughs> every, every so often. Um, but it, you're known. You, you're known as an expert on and having developed a lot of different areas of national security law as well, both on the district court and on the foreign intelligence surveillance court. So uh, between FISA and the Classified Information Procedures Act, uh, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, um, and and other na areas of of national security law, Guantanamo, um, but. One uh, former very senior national security lawyer once posited to me that he thought that FOIA in some ways was what really gave rise to important elements of national security law across the spectrum, spectrum especially when it came to requests of the National Security Agency during the Vietnam era. Um, I mean, what do you think of that thesis? Well, I, th I think it's true. I mean, I think that for the longest time, you know, NSA was never thought to be subject at all to any open records uh, production or to any kind of uh, production of, of any records to the public. And, and when it became subject to FOIA uh, was a rude awakening. Uh, the, the NSA and, and CIA uh, are extremely conscientious about their duty to protect national security secrets. And I find both of them to be uh, extremely helpful to the court in trying to uh, marshal the arguments that are very helpful to the court so that we can understand the issues. Uh, I uh, sometimes uh, get uh, Supplemental briefing on those kinds of issues. I find that across the board, they are excellent lawyers. They are, provide excellent help. Uh, I think when I do seminars for judges for the Federal Judicial Center and otherwise, my concern is that many judges think that you just give blind deference to the security agencies, and I do not think that's what Congress ever intended, and I don't think that's what the Constitution envisions, that we have to give deference to national security concerns, but it's not blind deference. We have to look at the issues. We have to study what the arguments are, and, and we have to decide ourselves under Article Three. we're judges, and we make independent decisions. and. Some of these issues are tough. Uh, I think that we have to make sure we know that they're doing what they're doing is right and that it's not for some 
a nefarious or political reason, but it's for some valid national security reason. And I have never found that when I got to the bottom line that I could not uh, get to the right result with the concurrence of the national security agencies, sometimes with having them reconsider where they were with my thoughts in mind as well as their own. Uh, but I, I don't think that we've ever gotten to loggerheads that could not ultimately uh, reach a result that, that we could both live with, but it, it takes some effort and some work. Uh, some of those cases are criminal cases where, uh, in, in, particularly in some of the terrorist cases, uh, the judge has a, a very tough task in criminal cases in particular where you have to follow the Classified Information Procedure Act, and, and those are very tough issues about national security. Uh, in FOIA, it's not as detailed or as tough to do because the statute is, is more deferential, but not totally deferential to uh, the, the classified information that the security agencies want to protect. Uh, but these are, these are difficult issues, and I find across the board that uh, they are conscientiously trying to do the right thing. I know that the ACLU and the, the national security uh, practitioners on the other side are very useful in helping them uh, keep on the right track. The FISA court, for example, has found these amicus lawyers that, they're help, that are participating in the process now to actually be helpful to the process, not a hindrance to the process. And I think that is ultimately going to turn out to be an improvement to the public perception of the FISA court and to the public perception that the FISA court is not just a rubber stamp for the government, but that it's part of a judicial process that will be more fair and perceived to be more fair ultimately. And, and transparency in government is important, and it's, it's important if the FISA court is going to be a court, it has to be partly look like it's a court, and a court can't be, everything can't be secret if it's a court. Right, and, and uh, circling back to uh, Mr. Perio's uh, introductory remarks where uh, President Johnson had cited national security concerns, uh, as, you know, when, when FOIA was passed too, and uh, as you mentioned, these other bodies of law. And of course, uh, in addition to those, um, of course, these aren't the only ways to shed light on government conduct. Um, one of your first cases as an assistant United States attorney was a case called Berlin Democratic Club. Um, which was brought as a Bivens suit. Can you quickly explain what a, what a Bivens case is and, and what happened in, in BDC? Well, in, in the Berlin Democratic Club case, the Army was accused of uh, spying on uh, anti-war dissidents uh, in Germany and uh, other activities that were during the Vietnam War uh, and engaging in other improper surveillance activities uh, overseas. And one of the first principles that was litigated in the case was, does the Constitution follow the flag? And the chief judge of this court clearly ruled that the Constitution follows the flag. And if the United States government is doing something overseas against a United States citizen, the Constitution is right there with that U.S. citizen. If the U.S. government is doing it, the Constitution follows the flag, and that U.S. citizen has rights against the U.S. government in that overseas setting. And uh, we went from there, and we started looking then at what the U.S. government had been doing to U.S. citizens in Germany, and uh, it turned out, uh, contrary to uh, what I told the court in the first instance, 
Uh, I filed affidavits from generals and others that turned out to be false, uh, and I learned a huge lesson uh, from that case and, and ended up taking uh, uh, 13 trips to Germany with my own investigation ordered by the Secretary of Defense that uh, ended up uh, in quite a Donnybrook that lasted for several years before we finally came to a settlement between uh, the ACLU and me as to how to get uh, out of that case with the settlement satisfactory to the ACLU and the government that ultimately settled that case some years later with the total reform of what the Army had been doing in surveillance activities in the Vietnam era. Another sem seminal example that from when you were on the bench, um, I think all I have to say is the case name. Uh, tell us about Cobell. Well, <laughs> uh, Cobell was uh, a case where uh, it's one of those cases where it, it was filed shortly after I joined the bench. And I knew from the beginning it was going to be a major case of 500,000 class action case of 500,000 individual Indians. The money was the Indians' own money that the government was holding in trust for the individual Indians. It was land and timber and oil interest that the Indians owned and the money was held, the Indians' money, it was their money held in trust for them by the Department of Interior. The Department of Interior had records but had bollocked up the records, could not account for the records, could not account for who they were paying what to. And uh, from the outset, I was dumbfounded because I had spent my career really after the Army and the Justice Department, and just for two years was constantly lied to by Justice Department and Interior Department lawyers and did not believe they were lying and was being told by the Indian employees they were lying and did not believe it until finally I figured out they had been lying. And I, I was just dumbfounded when I finally figured out that I had been told all these lies and uh, you don't want to lie to me for two years and think you're not going to pay a price. <laughs> so the price ended up being uh, the, the first Secretary of, of Interior and Secretary of Treasurer held in contempt. It was the first time, I think, we have shown that it was the first cabinet member held in contempt by a member of the judiciary. I think in history uh, it was so egregious that uh, – the administration could not even appeal my contempt finding. Uh, the administration changed, and I thought the new administration would come in and wear the, the white hat. They didn't, so I held the second Secretary of Interior in contempt. But the result of that was, although uh, I was confident of what I did, the Court of Appeals decided that better to just remove me from the case because I was too pro-Indian. And uh, they... Uh, the final result was uh, the case settled on appeal, uh, and the Indians got $3.4 billion, which I thought to me proved that I had been right all along. The Indians were screwed out of more than $3.4 billion, but the government coughed up $3.4 billion to make the case go away. Uh, for, it, for Indians would have never got the $3.4 billion if I hadn't forced the government to produce all the documents they did produce. I will say that. And, and for perspective, the $3.4 billion is the largest settlement the U.S. government has ever uh, entered into, uh, at least certainly at that time. I'm not sure if it's been eclipsed. I, I think it's still the largest settlement ever by the government. It's $3.4 billion. Yeah. And, and um, one reason for, the government was so scared of it was the money, obviously. Right. It's, that's a chunk of change. Um, I, for everybody watching, uh, there there is a documentary on the Cobell case called uh, 100 Years that just cycled off Netflix after uh, after two years, but I'm told that you can still stream it on PBS until March 21st. It's a fascinating case. Um, but, Judge, as we uh, get closer to the end, that we've talked a lot about executive branch. Um, and obviously the it, Congress and the courts are subject to some different rules. Um, I, you know, should, 
should Congress or, or the courts be subject to greater transparency law? I'm, I'm doubtful. Uh, the courts are, are very open. Uh, most of our proceedings are open. We really have to justify closing anything. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're, you know, we really do very little in camera. And, uh, and we have to justify anything we're going to do in camera uh, or ex parte. Uh, I, I think that, uh, and Congress mostly is open. They, they have very few hearings that aren't open. And, you know, I, I, I'm pretty satisfied with how the courts and Congress are doing. They're not, I mean, they're always going to be backroom deals, but, I mean, you can't, I think that, I don't think that's a, I don't perceive that to be anything that, that would be cured by legislation. Uh, I may be wrong. I, I don't know if they're proponents of anything. I haven't seen any legislation that I thought would actually cure anything. Uh, I do think in terms of, there's a lot of talk about whether the Supreme Court should televise their proceedings. I have, I've been privileged to talk about that with some of the members of the court, and, and I will tell you up front, I think that the members of some members of the court, I'll put it that way, uh, have a valid concern that it would impact the way they use the arguments. Now, they have a a, a, a small bar that they use the arguments with that small, very uh, insular bar, uh, and they use the arguments as a way to talk among themselves with the members of their bar, and they really, it's the first discussion they have among themselves of the case. They don't talk among themselves until they have the oral argument. They don't go lobby each other about how they're going to do the case until they hear the lawyers, and they have a session after the oral argument where they vote and they assign out the opinion and the opinions, majority and minority, and that's right after the oral arguments, probably that Friday or the following week. And so that's a key time. That's all key to the argument, and they use the argument among themselves, and having these knowledgeable lawyers, some of the questions traditionally have been, to bring up points they want to make to their colleagues, and they're using the argument to make sure they're getting those points across to their colleagues. So the argument is in a way that they use it as part of, of how they're going to take positions in conference with their colleagues, and that's part of how they use the argument. And the, the experienced members of the bar know that's how the argument is being used, and they're, they're practicing their arguments on that kind of a basis. Now, if you're if you're Ford Motor Company and you have an argument there and uh, millions of people are going to be watching that argument, are you worried about those few people that care about how the case comes out or are you worried about the 20 million people that are going to be watching it on TV? And I tell you, Ford might really care more about that 20 million people than this little case. And the Supreme Court justices, I think, are worried to death about what's going to happen to their arguments. Uh, so I, I really understand why they're reluctant. I understand the argument on why they're reluctant, uh, some of them. Uh, I think that what, what has ended up happening from the pandemic and having these arguments on tape by uh, oral arguments on, on audio tape is kind of interesting. Uh, I think that there's been some speculation that the junior justices have kind of liked it because they get some automatic time that otherwise is time to squeeze in, hard to squeeze in your questions because everybody gets a limited amount of time. It seems to have uh, loosened up things to where Justice Thomas now asks more questions than he ever has. It, it sort of demonstrates the fallacy 
um, the old school idea that Justice Thomas was just a clone of Justice Scalia. And many more people now realize Justice Thomas is actually brilliant and has a mind of his own and, and thinks for himself and, and demonstrates it in the questions he asks. And, and people now realize that he's a leader in his own right and thinks some pretty deep thoughts for himself that he demonstrates in questions he asks now, uh, which surprises some people, interestingly enough, to me. Uh, I, I think that this whole debate is is pretty interesting question. Uh, I can't see the Supreme Court agreeing to ever television. Whether they would agree to delay the audio, I don't know. Maybe progressives might want to do it. I'm not so sure that the court is ready for that yet either, frankly. It, sticking. From the public point of view, I, I sort of think the public has a better understanding of the Supreme Court from this experience because they understand better that these are serious-minded people that look at the issues conscientiously, that don't look at it as political, uh, as politicians that look at it as serious legal questions that are looking at serious legal issues and five to four votes don't really mean what the public perception is of what five to four votes mean. These are these are tough questions that they're dealing with at the Supreme Court level. Sticking with the uh, with the courts, uh, but but shifting it both in in the level of the court and from civil to, to criminal, looking at the traditionally very secret grand jury process. Um, numerous cases, including several of yours, quote the adage that there's a tradition in the United States older than the nation itself that proceedings before a grand jury should remain secret. Um, last year, it was a big deal when um, Attorney General Barr wrote a letter to Congress citing uh, the rule of criminal procedure, Rule 6E, about grand jury secrecy for uh, saying why parts of the Mueller report couldn't even be turned over to Congress. Um, but you had held in a case in, in 2011 called Cutler uh, that a district court has inherent powers with respect to grand juries and that special circumstances can justify the release of grand jury materials outside the balance of Rule 6E. In that case, you ordered President Nixon's grand jury testimony and some other materials to be released. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, I, I thought that uh, traditionally, uh, there is inherent power in the court that should allow historical records uh, to uh, overcome the, the 6E uh, justification for keeping sealed. It was so unusual to have a president actually testify in a grand jury. Dixon had testified in the grand jury, and it was uh, – Almost all the participants were dead by the time that uh, the case came to me as chief judge of the court. And it seemed to me that I should have the inherent power to release historical records like that uh, to the public and that the public should have the right to see what had happened in the criminal case of Nixon and, and the Watergate people that were all, – all of the basic participants were dead by this time. And, and the public was still very interested in what had happened in Watergate and whether Nixon was guilty or not guilty and all the issues, many in the public were still very interested. And so it seemed to me that, it, that the chief judge of the court overseeing the grand jury should still have the power to do it. And so I relied on that inherent power of the court. Uh, and ultimately, I did release the uh, – transcript of Nixon's testimony, and, and it was released. In subsequent uh, litigation by others who then sought other material from grand juries, uh, in another case, that I issued three opinions in 2011 then on the same day, and in one of those called McKee. 2017. 2017, yeah. whatever it was. Uh, in one of those in McKeever, I did not release something in and uh, he appealed, and, and ultimately, the Court of Appeals uh, 
found that the special circumstance that I used in, in the Nixon case uh, was not valid, that the courts had no power to ever violate 6E. And uh, so although my, my theory had been adopted by the Second Circuit, the Seventh Circuit, and I think the Eleventh Circuit had all gone with what I did, the D.C. Circuit had gone contrary to me. And so my own circuit uh, abandoned me, and three other circuits affirmed me, but the, the Supreme Court went the other way. And luckily for me, Justice Breyer, of all people, uh, wrote a separate opinion. And in well, you can quote uh, what Breyer said, because uh, I've gone off. Uh, I think you have the quote of what Breyer said in his, in his I, I, was it a separate concurrence. Uh, yeah, he, he issued a statement uh, regarding denial of cert. Um, I want to I, I want to quote you first, then I'll quote Breyer, and then I think we have to turn it over for a, for a question or two. Um, because McKeever, West decided I think because we released three of these opinions in the same day. Uh, West only uh, published one of them. McKeever was not it, uh, which. I'll pontificate. I think I think McKeever was the most important, both because he went to the Supreme Court, but also because of the contents of the actual case. There was a non-Watergate case. There was a fascinating fact pattern, and you dropped in a footnote. I'll quote: "It is antithetical to our system of government to say that some class of public records is forever and always off limits, even from consideration for public release." even after the underlying practical needs for secrecy in the records has long since lapsed. In a constitutional democracy that values openness and transparency in government records, no matter how sensitive, it is imperative that the court look to the underlying purpose of any rule calling for nearly unqualified secrecy of a class of records for perpetuity. Now, uh, Justice good. Breyer's <laughs> it's beautifully written. Um, Justice Breyer um, seems to have agreed that, there, uh, that Rule 60 deserves another look. He said whether the district court retains authority to release grand jury materials outside the situation specifically enumerated in the rules uh, or in situations like this is an important question. He says it's one that I think the Rules Committee both can and should revisit. Well, as a result of that invitation, uh, I got uh, – my current chief judge, uh, Beryl Howell, and I have sent a letter to the Rules Committee of the Judicial Conference of the U.S., and they have agreed in April to take up this issue of whether 60 should be amended. Uh, uh, and, and we cited Justice Breyer as our justification for it, we think. And uh, using the language that Adam wrote for me that I signed, <laughs> <laughs> that opinion, uh, we lead with that in, in the letter that Beryl and I sent to the Rules Committee, saying we should amend 60 and, and give us that express authority that I sold to the three circuits but could not sell to my own circuit. I wasn't going to take credit for it. That was your opinion. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but thank you, sir. Um, Look, I, I know that uh, we've run time. We, we can talk about this for, for hours and, and filibuster, if you will. Um, uh, Judge Lambert, you've been a, a fiery presence uh, here as, as well. And I guess to circle back to another uh, uh, Washington Post article uh, recently talking about uh, the debates in the White House about uh, whether to release visitor logs, uh, they, a piece in the post reminded us of a 2016 statement by Josh Ernest, who has been President Obama's press secretary, who posited that there is really no constituency for government transparency except the press. I think we'll leave it to the next uh, panel to uh, to debate that proposition. I, I think we, we both would take issue with that. Uh, if anybody has questions and if there's time, uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll take them, but our hour is running. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, everybody, uh, for, for allowing us to, to be with you today. Hi, this is Martha Martha, 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 Martha. Martha, go ahead, please. I think we have a couple of questions for the judge. Okay. Yeah, I've been, uh, we've been keeping track of the chat. 
Um, we have one question. Um, does the judge think the 25-year limit is being enforced for records in reference to B-5? Exemption five. Certainly not. And it should be. And I, I have a couple of cases now where uh, I'm, I'm trying to force it. Thanks. And as a follow a follow up to the question about congressional records, how about Capitol Police? Should they be subject to FOIA? Uh, I I don't know. Uh, I I I I I don't think I've ever ruled on the issue, and I probably will get it now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I have the first one. Uh, you know, I had this. Well, I can't talk about that. I had I before just before I came on this call, I have I ordered the, the government to show me why I couldn't release a tape that they put in evidence last weekend in my shaman case. And they showed I ordered the show calls by Friday. Their response was that they can release it, but we don't have a way to to put it in the record and I just signed an order to make it public. Uh and there's a big issue about what Capitol Police tapes uh, have to be under protective order and what can be public. And I better not get into all that, but I just I just made some things public that they didn't think could be made public. So I better not get into that because the stuff that I, I used in evidence to hold the shaman in jail, uh, I made public, and I didn't care what they said. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so a lot. In evidence in a criminal case, I didn't really care where it came from. They put it in evidence in a criminal case, and I was going to use it, so I was going to make it public. Okay. Um, I think our last question has to do about the consequences for agencies that uh, simply stop processing FOIA requests and ignore statutory deadlines, uh, whether during the pandemic or otherwise. Well, it, it's a problem because you have to figure out I mean, some of the agencies where they have the people that would do processing of particular classified FOIA stuff were only older employees who really were most subjected to the pandemic and most at risk and did not have vaccine and really were not coming to work at all and could not work from home with classified information. So it's hard for me to say that the agency had to make them come to work in conditions that they were really putting their lives at risk. So, I mean, you really have to go agency by agency and what personnel they have. It, it's a very intensive inquiry into what you do. You certainly can't do it across the board. But what, what, what you can do in the particular agency, you really, it, it takes an inquiry into, into how they can cope with the pandemic. It, it, it's not an easy answer. I mean, I have, I have cases where the agency convinced me that the people they would need to actually work on it, there was no one that had familiarity or could have familiarity with the documents that, you know, would know about that kind of classified information that was could safely actually physically come in and do the work in the classified setting that they need to do it in. Because they weren't going to take all those classified documents to their house. And they, there was no way it was going to get done. I, I could understand that. But they did have to show that. I wasn't going to say you can just stop. Martha, we, we started with a, a quote from his uh, from Judge's opinion in LeBeau a few years ago, and I, I suppose we can close with it, too, on exactly that point. Uh, Judge said at one point, courts go to great lengths to protect the rights of FOIA plaintiffs, uh, individual citizens who seek to shine the light of transparency upon the operations of their government. Sometimes they successfully prompt the revealing of government misconduct. Oftentimes they endeavor to research a, a topic of personal interest or fulfill a historical curiosity and may or may not be satisfied by what is released versus what is withheld. 
In the process, innumerable resources are poured into the balancing of interests of justice that apply in these cases. And I'll wrap up selfishly uh, with, a, with a controversial uh, statement that, you know, it's certainly true that democracy and accountability are, are not necessarily efficient, but I'm being marginally sarcastic when I say, show me an efficient government and I'll show you a society that you probably don't want to live in. Um, and <laughs> there, there's, uh, take from that what you will, it, it, it's a whole other conversation that we'll be happy to come back for, but uh, that, that's my last word. And, and thank you all again. All right, terrific. Thank you, Adam. And uh, please uh, I invite everyone to thank the judge for his time today. It was a very robust discussion of open government and the judicial landscape. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. I wish we had another hour because I think you would fill it very quickly, Judge. So thank you again. Good. All right. Uh, we're going to move to the next step of our program. Uh, Judge Lambert has promised to stay on and observe. So we welcome your, your uh, continued participation. Uh, next to our program this afternoon, uh, we are honored to share pre-recorded video from Senator Patrick Leahy. As many of you know, Senator Leahy is a longtime leader in promoting government transparency and strengthening the Freedom of Information Act. Senator Leahy has worked with members of, on both sides of the aisle to enhance and expand Americans' access to information about what the government is doing. He has authored several important pieces of open government legislation and chaired several hearings in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Of particular significance for um, my office, OGIS, Senator Leahy is the author of the Open Government Act, which in 2007 made the first significant reforms to FOIA in more than a decade. The Open Government Act, of course, uh, which became law in 2007, created our office, OGIS. So without further ado, we look forward to hearing Senator Leahy's remarks today. And as a quick reminder, for the speakers, please mute your phones and your audio will be coming through your, your computer speakers. Just a reminder, please turn on your computer speakers. So I'd like to thank my friend David Perriol. You know, he's the archivist of the United States. And he's hosting this important Sunshine Week event. We both know, David and I and everybody else, that the American people's right to know what their government is doing. That's in our FOIA, our nation's premier transparency law. That's essential to protect it against abuses by the powerful. It's a transparency tool. It empowers the American people with a role in serving as a check against government wrongdoing. It's a defining feature of American democracy. It reflects a simple principle that a government of, by, and for the people cannot be one whose actions are hidden from them. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has posed serious and unique challenges to government transparency. We've seen FOIA processing across agencies being dramatically affected. Now, I'm going to work with both Democrats and Republicans to fully understand how FOIA compliance has been affected during the pandemic. What lessons we learned and what additional resources are required to improve FOIA processing. But I'm increasingly concerned about another problem. This is one not caused by the pandemic. It's the growing blind spot we have regarding private contractors engaged in government functions. I find that a lot of Americans don't realize that nearly 40% of our federal government operations are run by private contractors, and they're not subject to FOIA. Think what this includes. Private prisons, immigrant detention facilities have been rife with abuses and misconduct. And Americans have virtually no way of understanding nearly 40% of the federal government's operations or where their money is going. So we have to eliminate this artificial blind spot in our transparency laws. We've got to apply FOIA to private contractors when they're doing government work. And that's not a radical idea. States across the country 
including Iowa, Texas, Kentucky, South Carolina, and many others, already apply their public records laws on private contractors doing government work. Think of it. It's just common sense. If you're being paid with taxpayer dollars to do government work, well, then you ought to be accountable to the taxpayers. And the federal government needs to catch up to the states. So I'm going to work hard this Congress on legislation to expand FOIA's application to private contractors. Without it, I'm afraid the Americans are going to be faced with an expanding cloud over the federal government's operations. So I want to thank everyone who's attending this conference. Your important efforts ensure that we keep bringing more sunshine into the halls of power. That's something we all want to do. All right. Uh, thanks very much um, to Senator Leahy for those remarks. Lots to absorb um, in that segment as well. Uh, so I'm very excited to introduce our next set of participants who will be discussing the current transparency landscape, a fitting topic uh, during Sunshine Week. Full credit for pulling together this distinguished panel goes to our very own Kirsten Mitchell, who not only is our compliance team lead for OGIS, but is a former journalist herself who used state and federal records access laws to shine a light on how the government operates. She has an MA in journalism and public affairs from American University and a BA in English from Mary Washington College. I cannot think of a more appropriate moderator for this panel than Kirsten. Kirsten today is joined by Michael Bekesha, Alexander Perloff Giles, and Katie Townsend. Michael is a senior attorney for Judicial Watch, a conservative nonprofit activist group that uses freedom of information laws to obtain records related to activities of government officials. For over 11 years, Michael has litigated over 100 public records cases in both state and federal courts. He has a JD from the University of Missouri Columbia School of Law and a BA in political science from Northwestern University. Alexandra is currently an attorney with Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher Media, Entertainment, and Technology Group. And between 2019 and 2020, she was a First Amendment Fellow at the New York Times, where she was the principal attorney in charge of public records requests. She has a JD from Yale Law School, an MA from the University of Paris Sorbonne, and a BA in History of Art and Architecture and Government from the Harvard University. Katie has served as the legal director at the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press since 2014 where she leads litigation efforts in public records, court access, and legal defense cases. Prior to joining Reporters Committee, Katie, like Alexandra, was an attorney at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher, specializing in media and entertainment litigation. She has a JD from the University of Virginia and a BA in English, and a BS in broadcast journalism from the University of Florida. Kirsten, over to you. I leave you in the hands of three attorneys. Good luck. Thank you, Alina, and thank you, Alexandra, Katie, and Michael for joining us today. Um, and thank you to uh, Judge Lambert and Adam Perlman. That was uh, a great discussion, and um, these types of conversations really do contribute to a shared understanding of government transparency. And as we know so well at OGIS, that shared understanding is so important to um, preventing and resolving disputes. Um, so I'd like to talk about a few things that Judge Lambert said, um, but first I'd like to jump into something that um, Senator Leahy said. He noted that, quote, federal government contractors make up, an, make up an artificial blind spot in our government transparency laws. Uh, Alexandra, Katie, and Michael, do you agree? Um, how big of a problem is this? And are there other areas besides um, private prisons and immigrant detention facilities that this affects? Sure, I'm happy to, to start with that one. Um, certainly, I think there are many, many agencies, including the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, um, all kinds of agencies use outside contractors. Um, and the Ninth Circuit just went on bonk to reverse um, an earlier decision um, regarding the consultant corollary. So that's the question of whether the deliberative process privilege under Exemption 5 would 
protect um, outside consultants. And um, the en banc court ultimately um, uh, recognized the consultant corollary joining most other circuits who have considered the question. The Sixth Circuit is now the outlier in questioning whether um, outside consultants are, are covered by the privilege. Um, but uh, there was an interesting split in the decisions, um, including Judge Bumate, a Trump appointee, and um, three Democratic appointees, all um, in, in separate opinions, coming out saying, no, the plain text of the statute says inter and intra agency, doesn't say anything about outside contractors, independent contractors, and so it um, does allow for a kind of end run around FOIA, given the vast amount of uh, the the, you know, the quantity of government operations that are now outsourced to contractors of different kinds. Katie, did you have anything to add to that? Sure, Kirsten. I would say um, a couple of things. I think particularly we've seen this become a problem in the context that were flagged. So in the private prison context, in the immigration detention uh, facilities context, um, so it is a hole in FOIA, and, and I think that we would certainly welcome um, steps on, on the part of Senator Leahy and his colleagues to, to kind of plug that hole in, in, in conjunction with, I think, other, other FOIA reforms that, that we, we in the sort of requester community would certainly love to see um, the Congress tackle, including things like public interest balancing and other, and other recommendations that have been made um, to, to the Senator. Right. Michael? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I didn't really think about it as being that big of a big of an issue. Um, I guess I haven't done enough uh, FOIA work when it's come to contractors, but I always assumed a lot of those records uh, were public. The limited requests I've sent, I've never seemed to have issues getting records um, that may be in the possession of a contractor. Um, you know, I think the, there's a definition of agency record or record at least in FOIA that may encompass those records. And um, I'm not sure that has been fully litigated. So, I mean, we always welcome um, improvements in the legislation, but I guess it wouldn't be on the top of my priority list at this point. Right. Okay, great, thank you. So um, let's return to um, Judge Lambert's and Adam Perlman's conversation. Um, I wanted to ask specifically about one thing and then sort of open it up to your um, reactions. But one of the things that the judge said was um, he rarely wants to look at documents in camera in FOIA litigation. Um, and I think some people might be surprised by that. I wonder if you could uh, talk about that. Um, do you think judges should be looking at documents in camera? And let's go around um, the same way we did at the beginning. So over to you, Alexandra. Sure, yeah. Um, as a FOIA litigant, um, we absolutely think it's a win to get in-camera review because it's the only check on um, the otherwise unbridled discretion of the agency. I mean, it, it might be that their position is legitimate, but we as the requester simply have no way of knowing. And so, um, from our point of view, I think um, in-camera review helps ensure that the system works the way it does, and if, it's, if it is done enough times to make the agency think that there's a real risk that their assertions will be questioned and um, subject to scrutiny, I think that's important. Katie? Yeah, yeah I, can, I can just add to that. I mean, I think, you know, the FOIA make in-camera review and available tool at the discretion of the district court judge for a reason, um, because it's intended to be an aid to the court to um, exercise the court's de novo review of our agency withholding. So I think, um, you know, I think we're all mindful um, that judges have a lot of cases and they see a lot of FOIA cases, and it, they probably don't require, and I don't think we would take the position that in-camera review is appropriate in every single case. Um, I think in, in many cases, I think, um, however, in many cases, I do think it's appropriate and I think courts would benefit for, from it. Um, you know, we tend um, in our practice to request in-camera review infrequently um, because we recognize that there's an additional burden on a court uh, on summary judgment. Um, but at the same time, I think there, there's certainly an appropriate case for it. And I, I would, 
I would welcome courts to use, utilize it more frequently. I think that would be um, probably beneficial for the, for the entire process because you may be able to cut out you know, perhaps one round of summary judgment briefing if you have um, a, an isolated set of documents subject to a camera review. Okay, Michael, let, um, let me follow up a little bit just on what Alexandra and Katie said. Going back to something Judge Lambert said, and that is that he feels when he's doing this in-camera re review that it's, um, he's looking at things in a vacuum. Um, so he sort of, I think he said something to the effect of substitute my judgment for the government judgment, and he is just looking at what the government is letting him look at, and he's looking at things in a vacuum. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I guess I disagree with uh, the other two panelists and agree with Judge Lambert. Um, my biggest concern with in-camera review is it really cuts the plaintiff out, the requester out of the process. I did see a process, and I think it was the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, where the judge allowed the requester to submit questions that the judge should be thinking about when looking at the records. But without that, the judge is looking at it in the vacuum, and the plaintiff really loses the opportunity to advocate for their position. Um, I still will occasionally. Uh, as Katie said, we try to do it infrequently as well. There are instances, especially when it comes to attorney-client privilege or attorney work product, where we think, um, you know, we're down to one or two records and we'll ask for in-camera review. But, um, you know, the bigger problem I see and one that Katie also flagged was maybe it'll cut out another round of summary judgment briefing. Um, for us, my biggest frustration is the fact that we have numerous rounds of summary judgment briefing. You know, the government, if they fail to satisfy their burden the first time around, we think that should be it that the government shouldn't get two, three, four, five bites of the apple because the law is clear, the government's burden. If they can't satisfy it, release the records and let's move on. And I think that would be a much better process than numerous summary judgment briefings or in-camera review. Okay. Katie and Alexandra, do you want to respond to that at all? I guess the only thing I'll add is I agree that it only makes sense when you have a narrow set of documents or a single document. So in some ways that, um, uh, you know, is a reminder to the requesters to submit good FOIA requests that are specific and a judge is never going to order in-camera review if you have a kitchen sink FOIA request for, you know, all email communications from 2010 to 2020 or something like that. So if you have a very narrow FOIA request, then I think it's an appropriate tool. Right. And I think I would just add to that that there's always an asymmetry of information in, of in FOIA litigation. I mean, the requester is always at a disadvantage in terms of what they know. They don't have the records. They don't have the documents themselves. And so we're doing the same thing that the, the, the court is doing in terms of relying on the agency declarations, whatever submitted by the agency. And so I do think that, that um, I, take my, I take Michael's point that it, you know, it does cut the requester out of the process, but to some extent the requester is already pretty limited in terms of what the requester knows um, about the records uh, anyway, about the contents of the records are limited to what, what the agency says publicly in their filings. And so in that sense, I do think it can be valuable um, to have, for, for purposes of the court, to exercise that de novo review of the withholding to, to utilize that in camera review as a tool. Great, thank you. So I wanted to uh, turn and talk a little bit about the new administration. Um, the new administration is just more than seven weeks old, um, and we have a new attorney general. And this morning at the Department of Justice Sunshine Week event, um, Attorney General Merrick Garland said, quote, open government and de democratic accountability are at the part of who we are, and he thanks FOIA professionals across the government for, quote, keeping the faith. Um, there was a headline on the Reporters Committee website earlier this month that noted, quote, a quiet confirmation hearing with some positive engagement on media law. So I'm going to start this question with Katie and then allow the others um, to join. Uh, Katie, can you tell us a bit more about the uh, positive engagement on media law? And for all three of you, what would you like to see come from Merrick Garland as Attorney General? 
Sure, and I should, um, I'll just take those both at the same time. I think in 2016, when um, then Judge Garland was, and Chief Judge Garland actually, was um, nominated for the Supreme Court, the Reporters Committee did what it does for every Supreme Court nominee, which is uh, kind of a roundup summary of their decisions that have affected, um, that affect First Amendment rights and, and particular media, media law issues, including FOIA and transparency. And one of the things that we, we saw, and I think this is consistent with um, uh, the Reporters Committee's experience as a litigant, quite frankly, um, was uh, in his record, Judge Garland had, uh, his decisions were in many cases um, very indicative of a judge that, that recognizes and, and strongly believes in the value of, of open government and transparency. I think, um, I, I tend to think of his uh, record on the D.C. Circuit in terms of transparency as involving really key um, access to court records decisions, including that Lice decision, and more recently in 2020, the, the Leopold against the United States decision. Um, the reporters can be with a party in that case, and, and, and its attorneys litigated it, so maybe a little bit biased, but it's a really groundbreaking uh, case in terms of the common law right of access and application of the common law right of access to electronic surveillance materials, Stored Communications Act and Pen Register Act materials. And I think that opinion really talks about in really powerful terms that the importance of trans court transparency, public access and oversight of the, the, the judicial process. Um, on the FOIA front, I think there are a number of decisions, um, and I'd be interested to hear Michael's view on this, but I think there are a number of decisions that I think of um, when I think of Judge Garland's uh, sort of record on, on FOIA issues. I, there was the ACLU against the CIA case. Um, back in 2013 or 14 that dealt with uh, GLOMAR response to um, records requested related to the CIA drone program. Um, that was in a, uh, the, the DC Circuit reversed a district court um, affirmance of that GLOMAR response uh, in an opinion written by Judge Garland. I also think of uh, the other case, these were the two FOIA cases that Judge Garland actually pointed to in his questionnaire for the Supreme Court in 2016, um, the cause of action against FTC case, which was the first case to interpret uh, of, uh, who is a um, uh, representative of the news media for FOIA status. A really important decision um, that I think was very pro requester because it interpreted, I think, consistently with the statutory intent uh, representatives of the news media to be, to be broad, appropriately broad, but broad. Um, so I think we were, you know, I, th I do think that these are issues that, based on his judicial records, that these are issues that Judge uh, Garland cares about. Um, the Reporter Committee, along with our, our colleagues at the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University, um, wasting no time, send Judge Garland a letter just last, or now Attorney General Garland, I don't have to get used to that, Attorney General Garland a letter just last week um, urging him to do uh, what he indicated he was he was going to do in his confirmation hearings when he mentioned FOIA, the importance of FOIA and transparency, um, which is to take some steps. I mean, really, he pointed to three broad categories of steps we would, we would love to see the Department of Justice take under his leadership, which includes um, adopting more stringent standards for um, DOJ defending agency positions in litigation, particularly in areas related to foreseeable harm provision, um, uh, encouraging additional proactive disclosures, things like visitor logs, agency head calendar, things that get requested really frequently that agencies can just proactively disclose, um, and in, improving other FOIA procedures and processes. I mean, um, we all know that just the Department of Justice um, and the of, uh, and OIG carries a lot of sway in terms of what other agencies are doing, um, and so doing things like encouraging agencies to work more with OGIS. Um, in the mediation process is something that, that we included as a recommendation. So there are a number of things that we flagged um, as things we would love to see the Department of Justice do under, under um, Attorney General Carlin. Okay, great. Alexandra, anything to add? Um, I, uh, I haven't litigated in front of Judge Carlin, so I, I can't speak as well as Katie to um, his record in that area, more broadly, I would say, you know, there are a small class of um, kind of political requests where you would expect the administration to um, matter for the outcome or for the position that the agency takes. So um, I'll give an example. Um, I just represented um, Senator Wyden and um, Representative Malinowski in an amicus brief in a case brought by the Open Society Justice Initiative 
against the CIA and ODNI, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, um, for the ODNI Khashoggi report. Obviously, that came out outside of the FOIA proceedings, um, and that is sort of about as political a FOIA request as you are going to get. I think that is the exception. Um, I, I think uh, the issues that we see most often in FOIA in terms of delay are not the result of sort of deliberate top-down agency decisions to, to gum up the process, um, and so I am perhaps less optimistic that we're going to see dramatic changes as a result of the new administration, um, whatever their sort of stated positions on transparency issues may be. Right. Okay. Before jumping over to Michael, I just wanted to jump in and say that um, the Khashoggi report is the um, report on the killing of um, journalist uh, Khashoggi, who was a Washington Post reporter and the report is the CIA ODNI report. Just wanted to put some context there for people who aren't as immersed in these issues as we are. Um, so, Michael, what, what would you like to see um, with the new Garland, um, Merrick Garland, as Attorney General? Yeah, I, I'm optimistic that the Attorney General is going to uh, take transparency and open government seriously. Um, I do have some concerns from his time on the bench on the D.C. Circuit. There was, in particular, uh, one opinion on deliberate process. Um, he was part of the panel. He didn't, he didn't author the opinion. But, um, you know, I guess the good news is it's kind of because of that opinion that the foreseeable harm um, provision was – made its way to Congress and passed, but, um, you know, the opinion there wasn't all that favorable to the requester community, and so I'd like to see um, a lot of the things that Katie said I'd like to see from Attorney General Garland. I think other issues that hopefully he can address and have some guidance for agencies and uh, control over the agencies that he has control over. Um, you know, one issue is text messages. Um, that's an issue that we've really um, started to see a lot of, that some agencies don't believe text messages or agency records. And so we think uh, Attorney Gen General Garland could, um, you know, make it clear that all communications, regardless if they're emails, letters, text messages, and now because of the pandemic, um, Teams, WebEx, Zoom, and any other type of instant chat, instant messaging platform, that those records are really being captured and preserved um, in response to the Federal Records Act, but also and then um, processed and responded to in FOIA. Okay, great. Yeah, text messages are are a big, uh, big, big thing these days. So I wanted to. Uh, you mentioned foreseeable harm. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, of course, that's the exercise in which FOIA processors consider the reasonably expected consequences of disclosure um, in each particular case. And I believe it's something that all three of you have litigated. Um, I'm wondering what the state of it is these days. And I'm going to jump this one over to Katie, because I know it was one that she was eager to, eager to answer. So over to you, Katie. I love talking about foreseeable harm. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I think it's important to point out, um, and I know we're going to talk probably about the two most recent Supreme Court decisions um, involving the uh, construction and interpretation of FOIA exemption, one exemption for exemption four, um, the Argus Leader case, and then more recently the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services uh, case that uh, addressed the scope of exemption five. I think it's important to point out that both of those cases involved pre-2016 amendment FOIA requests. So neither of them dealt with um, the interplay between the foreseeable harm provision or the additional requirements of the foreseeable harm provision alongside those exemptions. So that, I, I always like pointing that out because I think it's important to, to, to note. Um, the foreseeable harm provision was added uh, to the Act in 2016, um, and it places an additional requirement on agencies in terms of their showing to the district court, but I think more critically important is that it should be affecting um, agency conduct in the, at the processing stage. So what the foreseeable harm provision does is prohibit, actually, prohibit agencies from withholding records that fall within the scope of an exemption unless 
the agency reasonably foresees that disclosure will harm the interest that it, or uninterest that is intended to be protected by that exemption. And we know from the legislative history of, um, of the 2016 amendment that Congress particularly had in mind um, exemption five and the deliberative process privilege when it was thinking about and when it enacted the foreseeable harm provision. Um, there have been a number of district court decisions um, that I, I, I think there are a number of district court decisions in DDC, some in FDMY as well, um, and I think uh, do a pretty good job actually of, of kind of interpreting and applying the foreseeable harm provision. There were uh, there was a case um, in 2019 or 2018 or 2019, Machado Amadis, um, the Machado Amadis decision, which is in the uh, DC Circuit, which addressed foreseeable uh, harm in the context of exemption five with respect to a narrow set of documents. Um, there's another case pending before the DC Circuit now that. Um, I argued on behalf of the Reporters Committee and the Associated Press just a month ago or so that deals pretty squarely with um, for the, the application of foreseeable harm to different types of documents um, that were withheld um, related to impersonation of members of the news media under Exemption 5 or pursuant to Exemption 5. And so I, I think we'll get more guidance. That's a very long-winded way of saying that there are some cases that have been percolating and, and developments and cases at the district court level, we're starting to see those at the um, appellate court level. And I think um, we'll, we should, or I anticipate we'll be getting some additional guidance, both from the DC Circuit and most likely from the Second Circuit as well, since there are some decisions coming out of the district courts in New York um, as to how, to, to, um, how that uh, provision should be interpreted and applied. Michael, what are you seeing with regard to foreseeable harm? Yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add to uh... So what Katie said, I think we've seen some good opinions out of district court and the circuit, DC circuit hasn't really addressed the issue and, um, you know, they should be addressing it soon enough in Katie's case and uh, Judicial Watch has a case also uh, where briefing recently began. So um, I think it's stay tuned. We'll have a lot more to talk about next year um, on the topic. Okay. Well, speaking of, uh, of, uh, talking about court rulings, we, let's talk um, Supreme Court for, for a, a bit. We've had back-to-back FOIA -back cases at the U.S. Supreme Court earlier this month, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service versus the Sierra Club. The High Court ruled that Exemption 5 deliberative process privilege protects from disclosure in-house draft biological opinions that are both pre-decisional and deliberative. Um, even if the draft reflects the agency's last views about the proposal. Um, I'm wondering, how do you see this ruling affecting agency disclosure? And in fairness, this ruling just came out, what, a week and a half ago? Maybe not even. So it, I, I may be asking this question prematurely, but I'm asking it nonetheless. Alexandra? I, I should say this um, was a case that was before my judge when I was clerking, so um, I, I'm probably somewhat limited in what I um, should say about it. But um, I think it's a fairly idiosyncratic case. I mean, it's interesting to me that the Supreme Court took it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it uh, gives us a lot of guidance on um, the issues that more frequently plague requesters when it comes to Exemption 5. In other words, everyone agrees that the standard is pre-decisional and deliberative. There's no dispute about that. And in that case, it was this sort of peculiar posture of where one agency's job ends and the other begins, what, what is final. Um, and uh, so I think um, in some ways, Ar Argus Leader Media, um, which we can get to, has more uh, broad implications. Um, and, and we've had time to see that decision um, bear, bear out in terms of um, sort of what it has done to Exemption 4. But, I think it remains to be seen what impact the, the Fish and Wildlife Services case will have on Exemption 5, but I don't see it as sort of some game-changing. I don't know if others disagree. Yeah, in I, terms of, I think you noted that it was idiosyncratic, and um, I, I think during oral arguments there was some chatter going on um, whether the case was really a FOIA case or whether it was an Endangered Species Act case um, because it dealt with records that were required as part of um, administ 
administration of the Endangered Species Act. Katie, I think I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, I think I actually cut you off. I was just going to say that I, I agree, um, actually. I think uh, it, it doesn't seem to be a huge departure um, from the way that DC Circuit case law was going. Um, it has been going for quite some time in terms of the interpretation of, of Exemption 5 and the scope of um, the deliberative process privilege. And so I, I, I agree completely with Lexi that it's, um, the Argus leader decision is far more impactful in terms of its, its practical ramifications on, on requesters. And again, I'll just reiterate that both of them were pre, pre foreseeable harm. And I think foreseeable harm, the foreseeable harm provision has the most work to do in Exemption 5. So even how, um, you know, how impactful U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services and the interpretation of the scope of the exemption, how that will play out post foreseeable harm, I think will, 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 it, it may end up not being particularly um, uh, practically uh, uh, impactful for, for practitioners or for requesters. Well, let's talk about um, Exemption 4 and the Food Marketing Institute versus Argus Leader, which um, the Supreme Court in 2019 redefined the word confidential in FOIA's Exemption 4, um, which, as you know, protects, quote, trade secrets and commercial or financial information obtained from a wide range of entities um, that is privileged and confidential. Um, and the Supreme Court ruled that confidential means anything, quote, customarily and actually treated as private by its owner. Um, and there's a question that came up during oral argument in that case that I'm going to ask the three of you, and that is, what is to stop an agency, I mean, uh, not an agency, entities from customarily and actually treating as private everything that's submitted to the government. I mean, anyone who's worked on a sort of regulatory matter in private practice, um, you know, responding to an inquiry from a state attorney general or something knows that companies do treat everything as private. Um, so that, that doesn't entirely answer the question. And that's where I think to go to um, Katie's point, I mean, in, in many ways, if we come back to what the foreseeable standard, what the foreseeable harm standard means, and we ask what is the interest that is being protected by the exemption, we come back to the interest is in some sort of competitive harm. And so I think in a lot of ways, and obviously this remains to be tested, but um, the, the impact of the Supreme Court's decision should be very minimal and we should end up back at something that looks like the competitive harm standard that we had before. But um, I think this comes up um, a lot in, in a variety of cases. And the, you know, the real question is, what is the government doing with these records if it's relying on them to regulate in some way, then, um, then it doesn't matter what the position of the company is in a certain way, whether, I mean, that's, you know, it, it becomes part of the government regulatory process. Michael, Casey? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a big concern, and I think it's uh, what the court's question was about. But, I mean, if anybody has ever seen, you know, companies like to put on, you know, we'll use emails as an example. You know, companies, they usually automatically stamp all their emails confidential or privileged. Um, most people know that just because you have a stamp on it, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, now that may mean something, and you know there will be problems when it comes to transparency. But I think, as Alexandra said, we kind of have to wait and see and see what the interplay is between the decision and how uh, foreseeable harm the new provision, um, you know, how the courts look at it and just go from there. I think um, it's too early to tell. Katie, did you have anything you'd like to add? No, the, these two covered. I, I, the Reporters Committee filed an amicus brief in the Argus Leader case, effectively sort of making this point um, that this, you know, that was a pre-2016 amendment case that um, foreseeable harm basically does the work of the National Parks Test, which is what the D.C. Circuit had been applying for quite some time, which is reading in um, uh, this requirement of competitive, or the showing of competitive harm, um, and basically saying that, that you know, maybe the court should 
uh, dismissed and <laughs> cert wasn't probably granted. Don't take this case. Uh, it didn't quite work out that way. It would have been nice maybe if it, if it did. I do think as a practical matter, um, we're, we're seeing some problematic, what I would say is problematic exemption for cases. There's a case um, pending in the Ninth Circuit that was brought by Center, or the request was made by Center for Investigative Reporting. It was litigated by the Department of Labor. Um, right uh, after the court issued a favorable opinion on the exemption for withholdings in that case, um, the private companies, uh, one of the private companies uh, whose information was purportedly at issue, intervened for purposes of appealing the decision the Department of Labor wasn't going to. Um, and I, I do question whether um, pre-Argus leader, that would have been a step that they would have taken. Um, I, I think it has broadened the scope of, of the application of the initial exemption, which is which is the question that courts are looking at first. And so I, I do think it is, um, I agree completely with Lexi and, and Michael that foreseeable harm, it obviously applies to exemption four. It's gonna be a, it's a well, it applies to exemption four. I think um, how that's gonna play out, uh, we're, we'll just have to wait and see. Okay, let's jump to um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, yeah. Can you all talk a little bit, and not just through the FOIA lens, but sort of broadening out how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected government transparency? Yeah, I can start with that. I mean, on the, on the plus side, um, you've had a lot more, especially at local levels, public meetings over Zoom, which means they're a lot more accessible to the public. People are able to, uh, be eating dinner at home, helping their kids with homework, and able to check out what's going on at a public meeting, um, and even participate in some circumstances. So I think part of it, the pandemic has been has been helpful. Um, same with um, some courts around the country. Now their proceedings are more accessible online than they were before. So from that perspective, I think the pandemic has helped further or advance um, use of technology to make uh, government um, more available to people. Um, I'd say that's the plus. The negative is um, FOIA processing is at a snail's pace, um, and it probably was beforehand, but you know, where I would have 500 pages reviewed by an agency every month, uh, I now have 300 pages being reviewed every month. And if you have a couple thousand pages that need to be processed, um, you know, these cases are gonna go on for two, three, four, five years. Um, and by the time you get to the end of it, you're gonna forget what you even asked for and why you, were, why you were interested in it. So, I mean, I think that's problematic, that being at the federal level. At the local level, you had places like DC where they essentially suspended um, the time limits that the agencies had to respond to FOIA requests, which means you couldn't sue over the request, which means practically speaking, FOIA was shut down. Montgomery County, Maryland had the same um, and other counties around the country also. So I think the pandemic has been problematic. Um, I mean, on a lot of reasons, but just talking about open government, uh, when it's come to FOIA, it's really slowed down and um, made records less available to the public. And. So it, it sounds like good on the open meetings front, um, but not so good on the open records front. Yeah. Katie, um, Alexandra, what are you all seeing? Yeah, I think, uh, oh, go, go ahead, Katie. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go. Um, the, uh, I think I get asked this question a lot, and, and my response is sort of how has the pandemic not affected um, access and transparency? I think it's, it's really affected every aspect of it, and I, I appreciate Michael pointing out that it's a bit of a mixed bag, actually. Um, there are some positives. I think the live streaming um, of uh, appellate proceedings, um, not just a, a live streamed audio at the Supreme Court, the live streamed audio um, and among the federal courts of appeals uh, consistently. Um, we're seeing access telephonic access to district court, federal district court proceedings in civil cases, which, um, you know, I will say as a member of the public and as an attorney, it's great for me to be able to listen to a, a hearing that's going on in, I don't know, the Southern District of California, or the Central District of California, um, which I would have never been able to hear before. So I think those are all good positive things for the, 
for the public. Even on the court access side, um, there are some areas where the pandemic has been pretty devastating, though, for public access, I would say, particularly among state trial courts, particularly in the criminal context. It's made very difficult for reporters to report on issues um, arising out of um, requests for uh, requests to be um, uh, to be let out of prison while their sentences are pending um, because of COVID. So a lot of those have, that has created some problems. I would say on the open meeting side, again, it's a bit of a mixed bag. You do have some um, local agencies that are using Zoom really effectively and actually broadening participation. You have other communities that don't have those kinds of resources that don't even have broadband in some cases. So it's a real mixed, mixed bag. I would say on the FOIA front, it's not, there are still so shining lights perhaps. Um, I think in terms of FOIA and state public records, it's been um, difficult. Uh, I think FOIA has already, there was already a backlog. Um, I think if you look back at the backlog from the 2016 shutdown, which was about a month long, that resulted in a backlog that we're still seeing um, the impact from currently. And so you think about FOIA processing being delayed. Um, in some cases, there are some agencies that are still operating um, or, or we'll say that they're operating their FOIA processing at, at 50% of what they were a year ago. That's been a year. And so you think of the delays and the backlog that's just being built up. It's really terrifying um, to think about. I will, I will note that, um, as does Lambert said during his, his uh, talk with Adam, that um, there, it is agency by agency. So, uh, you know, we certainly saw on the, on the, as litigants, um, there were agencies that operated on classified servers that had to shut down their, their FOIA processing. That wasn't true with respect to all agencies. So it isn't, it isn't kind of across the board, but we've certainly seen things slow down, I would say, pretty significantly everywhere. And that was also, Michael pointed out, that that's the case at the state public records level as well, and it has been. It's not just um, municipalities and, and states that have stopped um, uh, sort of through emergency action stop FOIA processing or stop compliance with the act, which we have seen, um, but it's also just sort of across the board, the same kind of issues you might see at the federal level. People aren't going into the office, they don't have access to the records, and it's really slowed things down. Ellen Sandra? I, I agree with everything they've both said. I don't have a lot to add. I, I think um, what Katie said at the very end about classified records is where I've seen this um, the, the biggest impact at the federal level, um, so national security related um, cases, you know, even if they're already in litigation and there have been commitments to produce a certain amount, um, if the AUSA says they can't go into the, you know, secured facility to review the documents, then you're at an impasse. And that might be one thing if, you know, COVID lasted three months, but it's now a year later and there has to be some, some other measure in place. Okay, so I think we're going to turn it over to questions soon, but I wanted to ask you just one more question before um, Martha hops on with, with questions. Um, and that is that various studies show both an increase in the number of FOIA cases filed in the last several years, um, and also increased numbers of FOIA requests from businesses and first parties seeking their own records, so people seeking records about themselves. That brings me to the question, is FOIA becoming less of a dis disclosure statute? And we'll go Katie, Michael, Alexandra. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, we, we've certainly seen an uptick and I think it's been pretty steady and consistent, um, a, a sharp uptick in the number of FOIA requests and in FOIA litigation under the Obama administration that went up during the Trump administration. I expect, I suspect that will go up for the Biden administration. I think it's a, it's sort of a trend that we, and we will see increase. I don't necessarily think that makes the statute or the act, you know, used by, um, uh, um, corp, uh, commercial requesters, for example. I don't, I don't think that that makes it any less of a, of a tool for public access, for public transparency. I know, you know, my constituency as a lawyer, the legal director for the Reporters Committee is news organizations, and journalists, and we've only seen an increase in the interest of reporters in using the act, um, and I'd love to hear Lexi, Lexi's thoughts on that from her, from her time at the New York Times, but I, I think that there's really fantastic, and again, I might be biased, but I think there's really fantastic 
um, reporting um, that is coming, notwithstanding the delays and the other problems that we see um, with just the processing and the procedures of the, and, and the delay and the backlog and all of that, notwithstanding all of that, there are, there are reporters and newsrooms out there that use FOIA incredibly effectively and do really excellent reporting um, based on that. So I think it, it, it is still and will remain still a, um, a vital tool really for journalists um, uh, moving forward. I think that with this influx of requests, I think to keep it um, effective, to make sure that it is effective and it's serving its goal, that um, the fact that there's an increase in commercial requesters, I think there are other things that can be done with respect to processing, including increased resources towards processing that can help um, make the system more effective and more efficient. Um, but I don't think that means, you know, that, that just because others are using the, the act, not just journalists, not just members of the public, that it's any less of an important tool. Yeah, I think FOIA is a great tool, but it's an imperfect tool. Um, you know, I think we've done a lot of patchwork over the past 30, 40 years to improve the statute, but no one's really taken a step back to look at the statute as a whole and see if it's still working. Um, so I always encourage members of Congress and their staff to take a step back and figure out if we rewrote stat FOIA today, could we make it so much better? make it more of a disclosure statute than a withholding statute. Um, I'm not quite sure there's an appetite for that um, in the requester community as a whole. I, there's definitely not an appetite for that um, within Congress. But I mean, I, I think as Katie said, it's a great tool. It's successful um, at times. I just think it could be so much more um, with some revisions, if not a full rewriting, but also as Katie said, additional resources. Use it not only um, you know, human capital, but also the use of technology could really um, have, have the agencies really be able to respond more frequently uh, or more more frequently and more quickly. I mean, the other thing I'll just say is there are a lot more records being created today than were being created um, when FOIA passed even 10 years ago. I mean, as I said, with email, text messages, all other types of um, electronic communications, you just have tons of records being created, and the agencies aren't equipped to handle them. And I think a lot of the delays you're seeing is because you don't just have one letter being sent per day or 100 letters being sent per day. You're having thousands of emails being sent today, sent each day, and the agency needs to figure out how to deal with it, and uh, Congress hasn't given them the resources needed to, uh, to deal with it. Yeah, I'll Thank take you, that one. Um, I, I certainly agree that um, it's a technology problem, that the number of records is vast, but also the capacity to search should be, um, you know, also dramatically uh, more efficient. Um, I think the, the question you raise about sort of all these other people using FOIA other than journalists, um, uh, is that a problem? And it, I think um, there could be some uh, you could imagine some solution shy of reforming the statute um, that would help with the massive delay that that causes. So Margaret Quaka at Denver has written a lot about, first she wrote an article called FOIA Inc. about the problem of commercial requesters, and then she followed that up with an article, First Person FOIA, about the problem of first person requesters, and there are different agencies for which those are different problems. So regulatory agencies like FDA have the commercial requester problem say, immigration agencies um, like CDP have the first-person FOIA problem. Um, and you could imagine, for instance, the sort of um, VIP access for news media requesters. We already have the fee waiver system, but a way to get a human being on the phone to address something, to move it through more quickly, um, to sort of privilege what the statute is designed to do in terms of informing the public without necessarily um, sort of creating bright-line rules about who gets to be a requester or not. Well, that's certainly an, in, an interesting idea. So um, we have one question via WebEx that I'd like to ask, and this is, you've probably seen it in the chat, but it does foreseeable harm play against the chilling effect in any way for open and candid discussions? I mean, that, that's the agency argument every time, right? That, that it inhibits the candor of agency discussions if all of this comes out. And then, 
I mean, I think it's a real question for the requester community. We've talked about what the foreseeable harm standard means for exemption four, we think is easier. Um, how you show that, um, you know, what, what exactly is the showing that we expect of agencies for them to meet their burden of showing that disclosure would cause foreseeable harm, I think is a harder question. Um, and, you know, when we litigate, we say all of these assertions are speculative and so forth, but I think it's hard to articulate what exactly the sufficient showing is on the part of the agency um, that, that disclosure would indeed harm the candor of, of deliberations, which is, you know, a, a valid interest protected by the exemption. You know, I would just say on that deliberate process privilege in the civil discovery context, um, at least in the D.C. Circuit, is different than it is in the FOIA context. And it's not supposed to be that way. And so courts know how to handle, um, you know, this exact issue, um, and they do it in the civil discover discovery context. And I would just argue that we have to get back to that when it comes to FOIA. I think the Ninth Circuit still treats deliberate process privilege the same, where you really look at the foreseeable harm of the decision-making process, the particular decision being made, and not this general idea that any decision-making process in the future may be, um, it may be detrimental to release the records, because um, it is. It's hard to figure out what it means to, you know, be acting in a fishbowl as one of the, you know, as the agencies like to talk about. Um, you know, just watch a, a brought a case on to appeal that um, concerned final drafts of a statement by former acting Attorney General Sally Yates. And the question is, if her deliberate, if her draft statement would be made public, does that mean future Attorney Generals would be afraid to have opinions? Um, you know, that doesn't really seem to make sense, but it may make sense when it comes to particular decisions, um, especially for lower level employees. But once you're a political appointee, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make as much sense. So um, again, I think the courts know how to deal with this issue. We just need to get back to um, what the exemption was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Katie, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with um, a lot of what Michael said. I mean, I think that the common law, the deliberate process privilege, which is what FOIA is supposed to incorporate, um, it's been interpreted quite broadly in the FOIA context and really gotten away from even some initial, if you look back at older D.C. Circuit decisions that address really, that are intended to address the scope of the deliberative process privilege, like coastal states, for example. Um, some of the factors the courts looked at there, um, you know, is the communication from, um, uh, someone who's in an inferior position to a superior person, someone in a superior position. Those are things that can also go um, and I can be considered when you're looking at the foreseeable harm provision, you're trying to determine whether or not it's the harm that the agency is asserting is going um, to, to, to befall uh, if the disclosure is made is a harm to the decision-making process because disclosure of this document is going to chill candid communications like this in the future. I think um, these are all these fa factual factors that go into play as to whether or not that harm is reasonable, is re whether the agency, it's reasonable for the agency to foresee that harm. Um, so I agree that there, there is an aspect of the foreseeable harm provision in the deliberative process context, which is about bringing it back in line to what it was really intended to be to begin with and has really just been expanded and expanded and expanded um, in the FOIA context over, I would say, over the years. Great, thank you. So we do have another question. Um, someone writes in, I'd be interested if the current panel has any suggestions on how to solve the processing delay issue for classified records. Do they see judicial orders forcing staff to come in during the pandemic? Do they have ideas? Well, I, would, I just wanted to clarify one thing, which is to say that um, just because an agency uh, does FOIA processing or review on a classified server does not necessarily mean that those documents are classified. Um, and I think uh, State Department is a good example where uh, they effectively shut down their FOIA processing 
regardless of the nature of the request, in part because they were doing everything on classified servers. Um, and that, I think, is a, I think they're moving away from that, actually. And I think that that's one way you can help address this problem of, um, you know, of ensuring that not having, um, you know, not requiring everything to be done in classified servers if what's being requested isn't, you know, it, those types of records don't need to be stored in that way, for example. That's one way to, I, I would think, to address that potential problem. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, I, I think a judicial order is a last resort, and you hope that you can work something out with um, the attorneys on the other side, and it might not be the AUSA assigned to the case, but a colleague who can go in and do some of the review. I mean, in the particular, you know, in the one case that I'm thinking of where this is really an issue, um, I gather very few people are allowed at a time in the facility anyway. Um, so with what we know now about COVID, I think the risks are um, – somewhat minimal, and there, there was a sort of funny back and forth where I was told, you don't actually expect someone to go in, and I said, well, you do receive your paper every day, right? I mean, someone is going into the printing press. When we consider it an essential operation, it manages to happen. Um, so, um, uh, but, but I would hope that we don't need to get to the judicial order part in most cases. Michael, did you have anything to I don't, add? I don't, I don't have anything to add on that. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, so I don't believe we have any other questions. Um, Marsha, do we have any others? Can I add one thing, Christian? Of course. I, I enjoyed this discussion. It's always good to hear practitioners talk about the real nitty gritty. So that was a very nice discussion. I enjoyed all of that. Oh, thank you so much. So, um, thank you. No other Alabama. questions. I think, Kirsten. No other questions. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Martha. Oh, there is there is one other. So I think I will ask this, and I'll ask it of Alexandra, and then I will turn it over to Alina for closing remarks. So this question is then also does the contract corollary parring against the foreseeable harm. And I'm I asking think this is that a, of you. Be, yeah, I think this is a reference to the consultant corollary, and I don't, I don't think they're at odds yeah. with one another. I think one's a question of what is included in inter and intra-agency, and, and then one's a question of even if you have fall within the exception, then have you also shown uh, foreseeable harm that would result from disclosure. So um, I think there are sort of two stages of the inquiry. And not not in conflict. Right. Okay, um, Alina, I'm going to send it over to you. But I would like to thank Alexandra, Katie, and Michael so much for this. I'm sorry we are not on the stage in the Gallon Theater in person, um, but perhaps the next time um, we will all be together. So over to you, Alina. Yes. Um, Totally agree, Kirsten. I hope we can all be together next year. Um, I hope everyone can join us in thanking our panel participants. It was a great discussion. I think we could also have gone another hour. So maybe next year we'll schedule it for a little bit longer. Um, David, do you want to uh, say a few uh, parting remarks before we close up? I just want to add my thanks to the panel and to my favorite judge in the DC District Court, and Adam, um, we're looking forward to being able to launch that biography here at the National Archives, Adam, so get cracking. <laughs> thanks, to, thanks to all of you who have tuned in, and I hope you have learned as much as I have um, and enjoyed the conversation. Stay safe and hope to see you in person, I hope, next year. Thank you, David. I really appreciate it. Uh, I just want to thank everyone who participated in today's event. Um, thanks for our virtual viewing audience for joining us for Celebration of Sunshine Week at the National Archives. I would like to just give a special thanks to our amazing OGIS staff who was instrumental in planning and executing this great afternoon. Uh, special thanks also to um, Special Assistant to the Archivist, Maureen McDonald, 
our Deputy Director of Congressional Affairs, Sean Morton, and to our WebEx Special Events and AV staff, particularly Jamie Atkinson, for ensuring that everything ran smoothly. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the work that we do at OGIS, please visit our website, archives.gov forward slash OGIS, read our blog, the FOIA Ombudsman, and follow us on our Twitter handle at FOIA underscore Ombuds. Um, thank you again to everyone for joining us for our Sunshine Week celebration, and we hope you will join us again next year. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. That concludes our event. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.